We are continuing uh, with chapter 5 of the Bhagavad Gita, verse 14 to 17. The Lord produces neither the agency for action, nor the actions of people, nor their union with the fruits of action. Only nature is thus operative. The all-pervading one neither takes anyone's sins nor anyone's merit. Knowledge is veiled by ignorance, and thereby the creatures are deluded. They who have destroyed that ignorance of theirs through knowledge, to them the knowledge illum illuminates that Supreme One like the sun. Their intellect dwelling in him, the self absorbed in him, intent upon him, totally devoted to him, their stains washed by knowledge, they no longer return by way of rebirth. There are some beautiful verses here. And you see, we are speaking of one who has attained, their ignorance is destroyed and they're illuminated. How does this illumination take place? We always hear of this aspect of light or sun. Knowledge is compared to the, to the sun, to the immense light of a hundred thousand suns or a million suns. Why do we keep coming back to this metaphor? During the process of meditation, when we begin to see ourselves, what do we actually see? When we mean, what do we mean by see ourselves? What we are seeing is memories from the past. We are seeing our desires. We are seeing our fears. We are seeing our emotions. And that is what you are made up of. All that stuff which is called Chitta. It's in the chitta. When these things come forward, are presented to you, the hidden comes forward, we say. When that hidden comes forward, you see it in the light of consciousness and it loses its power over you. As long as it's hidden, it's in the dark, you do not see it. It has a certain power over you. That is the unconscious mind. It's in the dark. If you enter a dark room, you know there are some things in the room. There may be a sofa, there may be a table, there may be some chairs. But you don't know quite where they are. You switch on the light and immediately you see where they are. What happened to the darkness? It disappeared. Where did it go? We don't know. It just disappeared. We come back again and again to this beautiful example that's always quoted in the tradition. In the dark, it seemed that there was a snake there. and You're very scared. You're afraid. But the moment you see that snake, so-called snake, in the light, you discover it's only a rope. You see the rope for what it was. It was only a rope and not a snake. The mind and the fear, the imagination turned it into a snake. So this light of knowledge transforms us. 
Most of the time, this knowledge is veiled by this ignorance, by tamas, by delusion. But when you destroy that knowledge through, sorry, you destroy the ignorance through knowledge, you are illuminated. And the stains, what are these stains that are washed away by knowledge? The stains are samskaras. We all have these samskaras. In the Yoga Sutras, we would call them kleshas. In the Bhagavad Gita, there are different names for it. Sometimes they refer to as pap and punya. Sometimes they have been given other names. But they are always the same thing. It's, they are samskaras, they are the impressions in our mind. And when these impressions are coming forward, they may be more negative ones, such as fear, or they may be more positive ones, such as friendliness, compassion. But all the same, they are... Samskaras. So when these samskaras are attenuated through the light of knowledge, the light of consciousness, over a period of time, you're purified, you're not identified with these samskaras. When that happens, you do not return to this plane, you have no more samskaras that need to be lived out. You're not identified with material things. You're not identified with aspects of yourself like false identities. You are then identified with the all-pervading one. The Bhagavad Gita here in these verses use different words. Prabhu, it says, Prabhu is the powerful Lord, the eternal one. Or Vibhu, it uses the word. Vibhu means the all-pervading, omnis, omnipresent, eternal, unlimited, abundant one. So when you are identified with that, you do not return to this material plane anymore. There are no more samskaras to be lived out and you have become limitless, all-pervading one. Okay? Focus on the idea of that light which is within us, the light of consciousness. That's the message in these verses. The destruction of ignorance through the light of consciousness. Okay? Vishal referring to a theistic approach in verse 17. Um, Vishal, these ideas like theistic and atheistic, etc., are coming from intellectual studies and uh, academic studies. And we have been consistently interpreting these verses of the Bhagavad Gita through our tradition, which is a meditative tradition. And perhaps it might be a good idea for you to catch up on the earlier meetings, uh, going through the earlier sessions that are already on the channel. We don't even use that language, you know. Um, we're talking about direct experience. And the reason that I stay with this approach is 
not to wander into intellectual discussions and staying with this approach is to motivate everyone to meditate and to attain something, even a little glimpse through your own direct experience. Miklosh says, uh, asks, what is the relation between relationship between the all-pervading one and nature? All-pervading one is everywhere. All beings, everything you see around us is pervaded by consciousness, some in a more gross form and in some more subtle form. Everything around you, including yourself, is consciousness. Verses 18 and 19. Toward a philosopher endowed with knowledge and discipline, toward a cow, toward an elephant, and toward a dog, as well as toward a cremation ground attendant, the wise are of a single eye. They whose minds are established in equanimity have conquered the entire creation right here. Brahman is faultless and even, therefore they are established in Brahman. These verses describes the one who is established in the self, in the all-pervading one, the one who has attained this eternal wisdom. How would you be if you would have attained eternal wisdom? We can try to imagine it. When you would see a dog or even a person or an elephant, you still see in them consciousness. I just said <clears throat> Everything around you is consciousness. All of nature is consciousness. And such a person has a certain vision, samadarshana, equal vision or even vision. And this describes such a person as one who sees everybody with that vision sees consciousness in everyone. He sees Atman in everyone. It describes further such a person, such a mind that's established, such a being that's established in this equanimity. He is, has conquered creation. What is creation? Does he become sort of a king or god? It's not a king or god in the kind of ideas that we have about kings or gods. But conqueror of creation is one who has complete understanding of the cycle of birth, death and rebirth. I've said this before and I know that I may be repeating myself here. In the Indian tradition of Sanatana Dharma, we actually do not have a concept of creation. I would not have used the word creation here. We speak more of manifestation. We manifest from that pure consciousness 
subtler forms become grosser. And so when we understand that and we are established in that, in di through direct knowledge, that one is established in Brahman. Such a person, a wise person, a pundit, not referring to a priest, but pundit as a wise person, not even a learned one who has read a lot of books, but a wise person, is also very humble. The verse specifies the word Vinaya. Vinaya means humility. Why does it refer to the word Vinaya, humility, which is not here? It is in, not in this translation. But this is an important word, humility. If you are learned or knowledgeable, book knowledge makes you proud, makes you arrogant, but we are talking about wisdom, not about learning. And wisdom makes one humble. And so the emphasis on humility. These verses speak of evenness or steadiness, equanimity. That is samatvam, steadiness or evenness, being established in that as a witness, always witnessing, always seeing all as pure consciousness. This is describing how an enlightened one is. It is not an instruction of what you have to do. Many, many years ago, I <clears throat> met a, a group of people from the western coast of India. And this group of people had a certain practice. It was a kind of a, there was a, a teacher who uh, gave a certain practice. And the practice was basically of looking around wherever, wherever you went, looking around and saying to yourself, he is Atman, he is pure consciousness, he is, she is pure consciousness, the, the, the dog is pure consciousness, everyone is pure consciousness. When they had their satsangs together, they would all sit together and shout out aloud, very loud, really very loud, shouting, I am pure consciousness. And they did that for a long time. <laughs> I attended the meeting only one time. And um, I had a sore throat after that. I was not enlightened. And um, I, I found that very interesting that these verses from the Bhagavad Gita were then taken uh, into uh, as a form of practice but a form of practice which was very simplistic. By looking at somebody and telling yourself, this one is pure consciousness, looking at a dog and saying the dog is pure consciousness, looking at a, you know, different people on the streets all the time, saying this to yourself all the time, I can only imagine this is kind of a hypnosis can almost lead to the people becoming uh, crazy because you can't attend to anything like a normal person. So this is not an idea from the Bhagavad Gita which says this is what you have to do. The verses are explaining that this is the sight of an enlightened one. Once 
the samskaras have attenuated and burnt up in the light of knowledge. When your ignorance has been cut asunder, then this is how you will be. You will see all with even eyes or with, with divine eyes, or divine vision. This is not an instruction of what you should do. This misunderstanding is very, very common. These kind of interpretations of the Bhagavad Gita I have encountered again and again. And these can be quite misleading. Misleading as well as counterproductive. Because if you spend your time doing that, all you will end up getting is um, a headache. Keep on parroting continuously. He is Atman. She's pure consciousness. He is a, he's he's Atman, and you know. And counterproductive also because the real samskaras that are there, you do not allow them to manifest, nor do you really look at them. In fact, it's a form of suppression of all samskaras. A lot of people are doing this, uh, maybe not in this form that I explained to you, that was a rather extreme form, but a lot of people are trying to do this, trying in the inverted comments, because if you are trying, you're not, you're not there. If there is effort, you're not there. The effort should be in having a daily systematic practice which gets you to know yourself and your samskaras. That should be the effort. These moments of light, these moments of insight, these are grace. These will come or they will not come. And when they come, they're a gift, they're grace. So something for us to be very um, careful about, not to fall into these conventional and misleading interpretations. Beware, be very, very cautious with such interpretations and reasoned faith is superior to blind faith. So get a glimpse of these few moments. You get a glimpse of this, you, you will be much better off than spending months or years parroting something like, I am pure consciousness. He is pure consciousness. She is pure consciousness. Everybody is pure consciousness. This is a mere... Um, hypnotism or some kind of conditioning. Okay. Any comments or questions? Short ones. <laughs> Verses 20 and 21. One should not be accelerated upon attaining something pleasant, nor should he tremble over attaining the unpleasant. Person of steady wisdom, entirely free of confusion, knowing Brahman, dwells in Brahman. The happiness that he finds in the self whose self is unattached to external contacts, 
he with his self joined in the yoga of Brahman, attains imperishable comfort. This is a good example of a translation that is not very useful. The way it is worded, one should not be exhilarated, seems to be like an instruction. But this translation is not very accurate. The original actually suggests a description. It is discontinuing the description of how the wise one is, the pundit, the wise one. Not the learned uh, priest pandit, but the wise one who has attained does not feel exhilarated upon attaining something pleasant, nor does he tremble on attaining the unpleasant. So this person of steady wisdom is free of confusion. He remains a witness and experiences unlimited happiness. The happiness that we talk about here, what he attains, is unlimited. It is not a happiness that is limited, that comes out of enjoying something which is transient. If you eat a nice dish, you know, you have a nice meal, you enjoy, you are happy, you are satisfied. But after a while, again, you have a desire. You may buy yourself a new computer. You're very happy with your computer. You enjoy it. And then again, after a while, there is that feeling, hmm, I need something else. That is impermanent. That's limited. But one who has attained the divine vision, the samadrishana, the divine vision, who sees Everything is pure consciousness. He doesn't get joyous when he gets something wonderful, nor is he troubled when he gets something unpleasant. He is merely a witness. Such a one is established in limitless or unlimited happiness. Most of us are not even able to grasp the idea of unlimited or limitless happiness. We are so surrounded by material objects and our usual daily lives are such that we only think in limited terms. We cannot even conceive of something that's limitless. If for a moment you would do a kind of a thought experiment, close your eyes and feel like you've turned really light, feeling light like a balloon, and you start to imagining that you're now beginning to fly off because you're very light like a balloon, and you're flying out of your window, flying into the sky, rising higher and higher through the atmosphere, feeling very light. You observe yourself above the clouds, still rising higher up until you can see the entire planet under you. And above you, you see the stars unlimited, endless. You keep going higher and higher. You're out of the atmosphere. You leave the planet behind you and you see this vast cosmos around you. Limitless, seemingly limitless. Do you get a sense of what that word limitless means? Can you even conceive of having limitless joy or happiness? This is 
a kind of feeling you get when you are established in the self, in the higher self. I hope that that thought experiment was somehow give you some insights into what this means. When you are up there looking at this immenseness of, of the universe around you, how, how immaterial it is, you know, these little cares of our lives, how unimportant our normal day-to-day -day life seems then. If you would be established in that kind of a vision, carrying in your heart that feeling always, this endless universe or galaxies, all carrying them in your heart, that feeling of infinity, then you would be in touch with that feeling of infinity all the time. How would you see the world around you then? These trivial things in your life which seem to upset you matter? Or would you be extremely excited about small little material things that you have? Probably not. Because your entire way of looking at things has now changed. Because you are connected, plugged into that which is limitless. And that is exactly what it means to be one of steady mind, samatvam. Always steadily observing, witnessing, all the time connected to that limitless in, within ourselves. You see, it, it's not something one can do or sustain for a long period of time. It's only meant to give you an insight or a glimpse into how it would be. To get there, and I repeat myself, to get there, you need to have an unbroken practice, a regular systematic, a daily systematic practice over a long period of time without interruptions. That was from the Yoga Sutras, actually. 2.14, it says, How long should you practice until you attain? Or, basically, for a daily, for a long period of time without interruptions. So, any thoughts, any sharing, any questions? Or is everybody very happily still um, settled in the stars and um, doesn't want to come back to Earth? Okay, then, you will have to come back to Earth, I'm afraid, with verses 22 and 23. The pleasures that arise through contact are causes of sorrow alone. 
They had a beginning and an end. O son of country, a wise man is not delighted in them. He who before leaving this body, right here, can learn to withstand the impetus arising from desire and action. He is joined in yoga. That man is happy. That man is happy. So Sukhi Nara. So with that we come back to the material level of things that are limited. Those things that have a beginning and an end. They are limited. And that which is limited, transient, does not make us happy. So those pleasures that we get through contact with our senses, contacting material objects, physical objects, external objects, worldly objects, different ways of putting the same thing. These pleasures are transient and we get only very limited pleasure out of this. Because all these pleasures have a beginning and have an end. They are limited. A wise one finds no delight in them, no joy in this. He finds his joy in the limitless. And if before leaving this body, right here, in this plane, existence in this birth if you can learn how to deal with the samskaras of coming out from desire leading to action then you would be joined in yoga you would have attained and then you would have that happiness that limitless happiness there's a great deal of emphasis placed here of doing this before you leave the body. Why? Because it is said that the human body is the finest instrument through which we can live out these samskaras, work them out and attain moksha or freedom. If you do not do it in this body, you would want to do it in you know, celestial planes, in a disembodied um, being. It's said that that cannot be, uh, that's not as effective, it's not as fast, it's not as effective and therefore it's a great privilege to have a human body traditionally they came up with an amazing figure of, of something like you get a, a, a human body like something like 16, after 16 lakh births, uh, that is 160,000 births in different forms before you get a human body. If that would indeed be true, then imagine how privileged you are and how long your journey has been that you now have a human body. And having this human body, treasure it, Look after it, take care of it, and make the most of the time you have now to attain as much as you can. So, this body is a great instrument to live out some scars or, of course, to go through the process of meditation and internally burn up 
those samskaras so that you can go beyond desire and karma, action. So while the limited form causes suffering, this limited form that we have is also a blessing. It has become very fashionable in spiritual circles to condemn the body and condemn the mind and say, oh, this body is just a dirty, filthy thing. The mind is a mad monkey. And I've heard these things so many times. I keep hearing it again and again. It's kind of self-condemnation. So after all, the body is the only instrument that you have. And the mind is also a wonderful instrument. If you make it your friend, both body and mind can serve you to attain the highest. If you do not look after body and mind, they can be a great obstacle for you. And so if you use this body to attain now, you can attain that limitless happiness. So these last verses was in a way a contrast between the limitless and the limited. That which is pure consciousness, non-dual and that which is a part of the dualistic world that we live in because we have a body. And it combines both in a very beautiful way for all those who are great uh, followers of Advaita tend to neglect this duality and this world or worldly thing matters that we can combine both in that middle path, that path of moderation, which is what the Bhagavad Gita is about, that we can live in this world with the right attitude, learning to use our mind and body and the objects of the world to help us attain the highest, so that they do not become an obstacle, so that they serve us, to attain the highest. And that is known as Advaita Dvaita. It's not just Advaita and it's not just duality or Dvaita, it's both. It's both. Okay. Miklosh asks, um, leaving behind all worldly pleasures. I don't know when I said that. When did I say that you leave behind all worldly pleasures? It, it was not, not directly said, but uh, it, it somehow sounded like um, the, the only pleasures are from this eternal mm -hmm. stuff. Uh, he didn't say that the only pleasures are from the eternal stuff. Um, once again, we fall into the, the, the old trap of, of uh, thinking that everything that's worldly is somehow uh, bad in inverted commerce. Um, but what it is, is that these worldly pleasures are transient, are limited. Which is not, which is not a bad thing in itself. If you have a body, and if you have some scars, and if you can manifest certain desires, that's okay. And if you can burn up those desires in the fire of knowledge, as the earlier verses said, you know, the, the darkness is, is, you know, just torn asunder by the light of consciousness, then that's wonderful. We combine both. The world has its function. It is there for you to enjoy, enjoy, hmm? not to get attached to. To enjoy like you are, you know, you would um, enjoy uh, 
certain things if, if you know they don't belong to you it's temporary it will be over let me enjoy it now like when you go for a movie or a th you know a drama you know that it's just a temporary thing you want to enjoy it and then it's over and so this life is like a drama is also temporary so enjoy it don't get attached to it don't get attached to all the different actors you know and part of this drama so all the objects, they are props in this drama. Don't get attached to them. Okay, it, it makes sense. Okay, yeah. thanks a lot. Verses 24 to 26. He who finds comfort within himself, who finds zest and delight within himself, whose light is within himself, such a yogi, having become Brahman, attains absorption into Brahman. The sages with their stains dissolved attain absorption into Brahman, their doubts sundered, they're self-controlled. They delight in benefiting all beings. Absorption into Brahman is close to these ascetics whose minds are controlled, who are devoid of desire and anger, and who have come to know the self. These are very beautiful verses which are describing in further detail how a enlightened being is. It's a description. It's a description of, an, of the enlightened one. It's a description of one who has burned his samskaras until they are no power over him. The samskaras are now like parched uh, roasted seeds or parched grains. Sometimes they use the example of grains or sometimes of seeds. You roast them. They can no longer germinate. And so, the stains dissolve. What are these stains? The stains are kleshas, samskaras, different words for the same thing. The Bhagavad Gita is a work also of literature. It's not, only a, it's not really a technical text like the Yoga Sutra. And so, it uses different words for the same thing. So, sometimes it says... Sometimes we translate it as stains, sometimes we say samskaras, sometimes we say, um, we use different words. So when the samskaras have been burnt up in the fire of knowledge, how is that person? So this describes, he finds comfort in himself. He finds zest and delight. That, doesn't, that, that does not sound boring. It's not cold. It's not a person who is cold and unfriendly. We always have also these ideas of, of an enlightened master or being must be, you know, very distant, detached, doesn't smile, if at all. It's just this kind of, you know... Uh, almost fake kind of smile, that's the kind of idea we have. And a lot of people think that they, they don't show emotions, but must be even cold. But in fact, this describes an enlightened one as somebody who finds delight within himself. He finds light within himself. The doubts have been all destroyed. And they find also delight in the welfare of all beings. Their focus is no longer their own self, but all beings. They become like King Janak, royal sage, taking care of others. That's what a king does, right? It's meant to take care of others. A king provides his people with 
medical facilities, water, food, you know, roads and uh, all the infrastructure, education. These things are taken care of by the king. And that is why often example of a royal sage or King Janak as a royal sage has been given. One who is attained and takes care of the welfare of all beings. So, the description is, goes further and says, their minds are controlled, devoid of desire and anger. So, controlled again is a word that some of us may have an issue with. It's also probably not the best word to use here. It means the minds have been purified. Samskaras have dissolved. And so, they have come to know themselves. And they're devoid of such expressions of desire and anger. In this few verses, we see very clearly the idea of light within oneself, Jyotir, light within. Such a person delights in that light within. Many beautiful ways have been used to express that, to convey to seekers how it is to be established in that. So we use words like madhu, which means nectar, amrit, which also means nectar, prasadam, prasadam is grace. Many different words expressing that same joy or delight which is experienced at that height of attainment. Why does the Bhagavad Gita go into such detail? Why does it explain so much in detail how it is to be enlightened? It's to motivate us. So we are inspired. If you are running a race and you can see, you can just see the end where it, you know, where you're going to reach, where you have to get there. You feel a motivation. You know, you, you know you're just there. You're right there and you're going to get there. And so, when you see what awaits you, you feel a certain motivation. Also, many seekers have asked this again and again. How is it? How does it feel? How, how is it to be enlightened? And so, Sri Krishna explains in detail here, quite an elaborate explanation of how it is. So, any thoughts, any sharings here? Any questions? Verses 27 to 29, these are the last verses of this chapter, of chapter 5. Keeping all external contacts out, fixing the gaze between the brows, making prana and apana even flowing between the nostrils. The meditator, the muni, meditator whose senses, mind and intellect are well controlled, who is intent upon liberation, who is devoid of desire, fear and anger, he is indeed always free. One attains peace upon knowing me, 
the receiver of all sacrificial and ascetic observations, the great sovereign of all the world and the friend of all beings. The first two verses, 27 and 28, are describing how, how to attain that which has been described in the preceding verses. And the preceding verses described how it is to be an enlightened master, an enlightened one, a wise one. So how do I get there? I mentioned regular, systematic practice, daily, unbroken over a long period of time. But what do you do? Well, we have a systematic practice, but of course here it is talking about the last bit of the practice. So it's referring to the very end. If you're going to do this, you, you will have difficulties to sit down and just do it. So therefore we have a systematic approach which leads us slowly inward. Here, this text gives you the last part. Keeping out all external contacts, meaning going within. It doesn't mean uh, making the room dark and uh, plugging your ears. It means withdrawing. To be able to do that requires already a mastery of sorts in withdrawing from the external world. It doesn't mean withdrawing merely in the sensory sense, but also through thoughts. Your thoughts are not dwelling on the external world. Making prana and apana even flowing. This translation, um, there are different translations in this one, gives the impression that, you need, that they should be evenly flowing, equally flowing. Your inhalation and exhalation. There, there would be another interpretation of this. And the other interpretation is as follows. It means that the prana and apana stays within. And that would mean the breathless state. Attaining the breathless state and fixing your gaze between the brows, the Agya Chakra. The Agya Chakra is the gate to the highest chakras. So, if you can withdraw completely from the external world, not just through the senses but also in the mind, mentally, able to attain that breathless state for those of you who have been attending regularly the pranayam sessions on Sunday, we did talk about the breathless state. And attaining that breathless state, you would naturally go to the Agya Chakra. It opens and go through. Such a ones, senses, mind, intellect, is buddhi, are all regulated, coordinated and such a one who desires liberation is free. The one who can attain this or achieve this is free. And what is the result of that? What happens? What is this freedom? You attain peace on knowing me me is universal consciousness, pure consciousness, Atman, Paramatman, who is the receiver of all. He is the doer in the sense he was the one who did the sacrifices and he is the one who received them as well because everything is consciousness. You are self-realized. You become self-realized. You're identified with the higher self or pure consciousness. The friend of all beings. Su Suhidam Sarvabhutanam. 
the friend of all beings. Who is the friend of all beings? That one within, Atman, pure consciousness, is the friend of all beings. In one of the finest practices that we do in our tradition, Atma Vichara, also known as internal dialogue, we've always said, learn to be friends with yourself. Talk to the friend within. And this is the friend within, Atman, pure consciousness, that inner light, Different ways of putting the same thing. And that is self-realization. So beautiful description in these verses today of the limitless as opposed to the limited. Description of the enlightened one and the attainment of self-realization. Beautiful verses. So I think it's best that we stop here. Um, it is also the end of uh, this chapter. Next session we will begin in chapter 6. And uh, I hope Everybody was okay with that? If there are any questions or thoughts? Uh, does anybody like to share anything? Still? No? Okay, in that case, we end the session. Have a nice weekend, everyone. Thank you, Radhika Ji. Bye-bye. Thank you, Radhika Ji. Bye-bye. Bye, everyone. Thank you.